first in his class at West Point and completed degrees in philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. He worked with Ambassador Richard Holbrook in the Dayton Peace Process, where he helped write and negotiate significant portions of the 1995 Dayton Peace Agreement. In his final assignment as Supreme Allied Commander Europe, he led NATO forces to victory in Operation Allied Force, a 78-day air campaign backed by ground invasion planning and a diplomatic process, saving 1.5 million Albanians from ethnic cleansing. His awards include the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Defense Distinguished Service Medal, Silver Star, Bronze Star, and Purple Heart. And as I mentioned in 2019, General Clark founded Renew America Together. Governor Tom Ridge is chairman of Ridge Global. He provides clients with solutions to cybersecurity, international security, and risk management issues. Following the tragic events of September 11th, 2001, Governor Ridge became the first assistant to the president for Homeland Security, and on January 24th, 2003, became the first secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He was twice elected governor of Pennsylvania, serving from 1995 to 2001. Governor Ridge's aggressive technology strategy helped fuel the state's advances in economic development, education, healthcare, and the environment. He graduated from Harvard with honors. After his first year at Penn State University's Dickinson School of Law, he was drafted into the U.S. Army, where he served as an infantry staff sergeant in Vietnam, earning the Bronze Star for Valor, the Combat Infantry Badge, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. After returning to Pennsylvania and to Dickinson, he earned his law degree, and later became one of the first Vietnam combat veterans elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served six terms. So thank you so much to our panelists for being here. And I think we're going to start with remarks from General Clark. Well, thank you very much, Liz. And it's uh, great to be here at uh, William and Mary uh, by, uh, by uh, high technology. Wanted to do it in person. We're really interested in hearing uh, from the students today. I'm very honored to, to be joined by Governor Tom Ridge, and, uh, who's been an old friend of mine. We've done this before. We did it at the U University of Pennsylvania. He's a Republican. I'm a Democrat. Um, I ran for president, didn't get elected, but, um, but uh, so the idea is to bring people who are familiar with politics and who know it, who are probably, uh, you know, on the uh, upper edge of the political spectrum so uh, we can sort of reflect on it without having uh, current aspirations. We're not asking for money or votes at this point from any of the uh, students. We just want to talk about the country, really, and about politics. When I got out of the military, one of my uh, old friends in Arkansas told me, he said, well, now, Wes, he said, uh, I know you don't know much about politics and you may not like it. You may think that, you know, it's dirty and, and, and a lot of double dealing and hypocrisy. He said, but you better understand, this is the way the country's governed. So you got to learn about it. And uh, there, 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 it may not be a perfect system, but there's no better system that mankind has devised. So, um, so that's kind of the perspective that we want to bring today. I think the issues uh, in front of America are really important, um, and we can solve them if we talk about uh, what the issues are in, a, in the least emotional ways possible. Uh, obviously, when you get into the campaigns, then emotion, voting comes from the heart. But what we're trying to do here in this dialogue is, um, is, is reach the mind and put the facts out there and help you all be better informed voters. It's a strange time in America with COVID out there and uh, Governor Ridge were just, and I were just talking, we got to get the economy going again. We got to do it in a safe way. And around the world, the challenges are there. China, of course, uh, getting a lot of publicity right now, uh, but uh, Russia's out there threatening Ukraine and trying to take apart the European Union. Um, and, uh, and everywhere in the world, people are looking for American leadership uh, while at home, uh, all we see on the news is COVID, 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 COVID. So um, it's a very strange time, and we're heading into an election season, and we're actually not hearing much about it. So with that, I'd like to stop because I really want to hear um, what Governor Ridge has to say, and we want to get into the dialogue with you all at William and Mary. Thank you. Well, thanks, General. I really appreciate this, and uh, for those uh, joining me, General, and uh, yours truly. As he mentioned before, uh, we did this at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, were quite uh, gratified uh, by the interest that students had um, in some thoughtful reflection in spite of the fact that they had philosophical differences 
they were able to engage in discussions toward you know, with the idea of finding common ground. So I said the very fact, listen, I'm a I'm a I'm a lifelong Republican. I'm a proud Republican. And uh, I got a friend who's a lifelong Democrat. Well, I'm not even sure he's registered. You know, a lot of military people don't register because they say to themselves, hey, I may be a general, but I'm subject to the call of the commander in chief, whether he's a Republican or a Democrat, I'm serving my country. But when I'm out of the military, and he's a proud Democrat. And that's the beauty of this whole, I think the beauty of the outreach that the general has uh, undertaken and we're grateful that William and Mary decided, yeah, this is something we should have. This is the kind of discussion we should have with our students, Republicans and Democrats. Do Wes and I agree on all issues? Not a chance. Do we work hard to find common ground? Absolutely. And you know why? Because partisanship has advantages when it comes to elections. But problem solving normally requires the best thinking, the multiple experiences, and just the general dialogue among all those we are pledged as office holders to serve. You know, once I was elected governor, and I've, there are two things in my life I'm particularly proud of. One, I can be associated in a very small way with a four-star general who had a distinguished service record of four decades in the military. I was in and out and gone in less than two years but we both wore the uniform and I'm proud of that and proud of having served as governor. And I will tell you one of the principles that we operated on in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is that once the election was over, my job wasn't simply to satisfy, appeal or orient my philosophy toward those who supported me. My job was to try to find the best solutions, the best answers to questions and problems of all 12 million Pennsylvanians. And so the whole notion of civil discourse, civility in government conversations and debate is something that I embrace. And one final comment, because I think we're much more interested in going to the Q&A and the like. I was just gonna tell you this right now, folks. In the middle of this pandemic, I'm not watching TV. I get my news a little bit on the internet and the like. This is no time for politics. This is a war against mother nature. And the notion that we still have inside some state legislators and even the difference sometimes between the Fed and the local and state government is somewhat troubling to me. So I think it is a timely discussion in the midst of this national crisis. And by the way, we're both Vietnam veterans. This mother nature is gonna kill as many Americans by the end of this week as we lost over many, many years in Vietnam. So let's get serious about this. There's plenty of time for politics at the end of this, plenty of time after Labor Day. Let's be constructive, let's be civil, let's exchange ideas, and let's uh, put Mother Nature on her back. So uh, happy to have this conversation to, uh, with my friend Wes and to uh, deal with the students and the moderators. Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much for those great starting remarks. Um, I'm happy to hear that the coronavirus pandemic is at the top of your mind as it is for me, I'm sure for many students and Americans. So one of the questions I have for you guys is, um, following the tragic events of September 11th, there was sort of unprecedented innovation in government to the extent of creating a whole new department of Homeland Security. So do you foresee the coronavirus spurring the same sort of innovation in government and what are the conditions that allowed government innovation on, on the scale of creating a new department? Well, first of all, I don't think uh, there is any need to, for any major restructuring of uh, government in response to the pandemic. Let me give you a couple quick thoughts. For decades now, political figures around the world have talked about the globalization of transportation, and finance and communication. This is now exhibit A of the globalization of disease. We were very naive to think that this is the first time a contagion is going to go global. This is going to be the first of many, number one. Number two, the innovation in government needs to be thinking about the resources that exist within government. And it's so interesting because of where we are today with COVID 
and then I'm connecting with my friend General Clark. That I remind everyone, and there's no reason you know that six years ago, this Republican teamed up with a former Democrat vice presidential candidate by the name of Lieberman. And we had a, and still have a bipartisan task force on biodefense issues six years ago because we were worried in the gaps within the existing government structure to oversee a contagion, whether Chinese or the Russians or the Iranians threw it at you, whether the terrorists threw it at you. We had anthrax, it wasn't, a, and who knows, it may not have been a terrorist. We, the FBI thinks they got the right, that's not the point. Or Mother Nature. And Mother Nature is the most patient and more adroit than any nation state the last time I checked. And so we made a series of recommendations that, in my judgment, had they been substantially followed and aligned and funded, we would have been far better prepared. So I'm not saying that, I'm not saying I told you so. In response to your question, there are a list of recommendations and, that exist today that I think if we put them into effect in the future, will make us far better prepared for the pandemics of tomorrow. Two great examples. Now I'd say we suggested in 2015 that there be a, a broad biodefense strategy, a single budget. We don't have, even today you don't know how much money is going into biodefense. And then ultimately we thought biodefense was going to be a critical issue in the, forevermore. And we wanted it to be run out of that, a biodefense council, a permanent biodefense council run out of the vice president's office. These are constructive ideas, modest tinkering. And if once we get through this crisis, we hopeful, be hopeful, bipartisan, civil, there's some recommendations. Uh, that's what we would uh, put before uh, the House and the Senate. They've accepted some of them, but unfortunately not all. But it's not about playing, we told you so, it's okay, let's get through this and do better next time. Yeah, I think that uh, it's a little too early to know exactly what the impact is of this is gonna be. You know, 9-11 was a, it was bang. And then after a week or so of uncertainty, it was over except for the anthrax scare that came afterwards. And, um, and I give a lot of credit to Governor Ridge because when he was uh, the Homeland Security Secretary, he started really the work on preparing for biodefense at that time. And we were talking about it then in the context of the anthrax scare. Um, right now, I think one of the big issues gonna come out of this is the, the, the respective relations of, of the federal government and states. Uh, we don't quite have it right in, in my view the federal government should be uh, running the procurement and the distribution of uh, essential equipment. Of course, the states and even the counties and the mayors uh, are the best experts at their local situation. They have to make the calls on things like reopening. Uh, but this is uh, playing out daily on television in the White House briefing. And um, I think it's inevitable that because of the publicity of the briefing, because of the um, variability of what the federal government says it's going to do, then backs off, then does and doesn't do. By the way, the Army's been tasked now to, to do some substantial role in the procurement system, but it's not clear to me or to the public exactly what role that is. So um, I think that's going to be a big area of discussion, as well as uh, putting more emphasis again on the biodefense. You can be sure this is not the last time that the United States and the world is going to be challenged with um, some uh, bio problem, whether it's uh, deliberate or accidental or man-made or, or natural. Uh, so um, let's watch this and see. It's gonna, this, unlike 9-11, which hit at the beginning of a presidential administration, this one hit with just a few, well, in the last year of a presidential administration. So that adds another dimension of, of politics to it. And so there's a lot of gamesmanship going on here. But I think we're going to have to, have a better uh, understanding across the country of what the federal government does versus what state and local governments do. I just want to put an exclamation point on what the, the general said. I think we remind ourselves that it is a republic, the federal government, uh, the, the, the relationship between the states and the feds could be a little stronger. It needs to be tightened up. But ultimately, the responsibility goes back to the individual governors. And you couldn't possibly come up with a national, let's restore the economy plan. It has to be almost on a, <clears throat> excuse me, 
uh, Wes and I were talking about it before, almost on a county by county level, based upon the information, the medical and healthcare information you have. And so I think that kind of reassessing roles, tightening it up for future, uh, future needs, I think is, is, is very important. It also goes on to think about uh, the nature of democracy writ large. Well, on the note we're of- I mean, we're, pretty good, we're pretty good about responding to crisis. Uh, we're not too good in anticipating them and preparing right. in advance. Right. Maybe, right. just maybe, we'll be a little bit more preemptive. But there aren't, too many public, there aren't too many public servants who said we anticipate a problem five or 10 years ago, five, 10 years from now, and we're gonna put forth this idea. That, that's that's uh, preemptive, we don't do that. Maybe in the 21st century, we gotta start thinking more along those lines. <clears throat> well, on the note of um, institutions having to respond in the moment and sort of adjust their um, mission or their capacity, I wanted to ask you guys about your experience with US institutions that have in recent years been called to do far more than they were designed to do or maybe that people originally thought they were supposed to do. So for instance, the military shouldered much more of the state building in the Middle East than anyone expected. And more recently, DHS suddenly became responsible for tracking and caring for young children separated from their families at the southern border. So given your guys' rich experiences with these two institutions, can you contextualize those changes with your own experiences? And should we expect this kind of mission creep to stay? And maybe we'll see these institutions adapting and becoming more prepared to take on those duties um, in the long run? Or can we expect a resurgence of organizations and institutions like USAID or the State Department that allows greater specialization in addressing these challenges? Yeah, well, it's a great question. So uh, let me start with, I'm just gonna make a series of statements and then we, you know, we can take them apart. Number one, the US military is really tired. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and now we're reoriented to another set of missions uh, to deter China and Russia and strengthen NATO. But uh, 20 years of combat, uh, r rotating in and out, not only the, the guys on the ground, but it's their families, it's uh, the, the airframes that we've uh, flown, it's the ships that haven't had the, uh, the proper expenditures, it's the recruiting, it's the base training. Uh, so, so the military's tired. Number two is um, we actually did nation building in Vietnam and, and, and Tom knows this very well too, uh, but we were lavishly resourced in Vietnam compared to how we resourced our troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. We went into both those combats uh, on a sort of a, hey, let's do commercial efficiency here. Let's cut down the size of the force. We never built an adequate force. In Vietnam, where we had, um, we had 550,000 US troops. We had 500,000 Vietnamese troops. We had a million Vietnamese and National Guard. We had 2,200 helicopters to do counterinsurgency. We never had anything like that in Afghanistan. And we went into Iraq with inadequate forces to do the job. And at the same time, we had taken the other agencies like the Agency for International Development, which actually used to have experts in it who did things. And we turned AID into a contracting arm. And so what they did is they hired Beltway Bandits firms where you paid civilians a very high price to go to Afghanistan, teach local farmers how to farm. And uh, a guy comes in, he's got a you know $200,000 a year contract to go there. The firm's making $500,000 a year for sending him there. And he's gone in nine months or 12 months with no institutional carryover and no learning. So we really, um, we really misused our institutions recently. Um, I hope we've learned a lesson from that. And there are multiple lessons, but uh, number one is uh, we don't really understand how to reform anybody else's country. We can't, that's their job. Our best job is, our best talent is education. And that's what we should be doing more of and more graciously. And uh, secondly, we should protect our men and women in our armed forces. They are serving uh, at uh, incredible personal cost. It's not about money. It's about the life experience, the family, and, and, and what you do to the families over a period of repeated deployments. You lose a lot of good people out of the armed forces. So we've got to be careful with that. And we've got to put greater emphasis on the non-military means of national power. Well, I'm going to put an exclamation point uh, after everything the general said with regard to the military. Um, there's no need for me to elaborate. 
He also mentioned the effective use of not, on military power. It's about the diplomacy and foreign aid. You have to triangulate. And one of the biggest debates it has been historically, but particularly the past decade, is uh, next to CEO or executive pay in the private sector, the subject that seems to get a lot of people roiled up and uh, get, elevate their heart rate is when you tar start talking about foreign aid. But the strategic use of foreign aid, of foreign assistance, uh, it should become an even more integral part of how we stay connected with the rest of the world. And obviously there's the diplomacy act as well. One of my challenges uh, with this administration is somehow, some way, they feel that America is stronger, better able to influence events internationally by withdrawing from the world scene, almost creating a fortress America. 21st century America and forevermore has to be more connected with the rest of the world. We need to have more and better allies. We need to deepen our relationship with NATO. We should be in a trade agreement with our friends over in this Pacific Rim. We should be extending foreign aid. You just take a look what the Chinese are doing all around this globe. So I'm not getting in to criticize what the Chinese are doing. I'm just saying we need to be more involved, not less involved, in order to accomplish what is our first duty, and that is to protect the institutions of government and our way of life. And we can't do that in isolation from a world that is connected. Remember we said at the outset, it's a globalization, transportation, finance, communication, crime, and now disease. And you can't run away from being part of that. Secondly, I would also say about the military, uh, they've got, uh, they do suffer from mission creep, but from time to time, they still are, do things better than anybody else. Logistics and supply, uh, you know, I think General Clark was uh, part of that task force. We'd have ramped up DOD and, uh, and they're doing a good job now. They built, uh, the Corps of Engineers, I think has built up 50 temporary hospitals and areas around the country. So you do have to rely on the military in areas of special expertise, but boy, the, the mission creep in terms of national security is really putting enormous stress on uh, the military. And uh, we have to be mindful of that and, and uh, deal with it once we get through this, uh, once we get through this crisis. Um, it's very heartening to hear you guys discuss the importance of uh, foreign aid because that is a very big research topic here at William & Mary and in GRI especially. So that's very exciting. Um, I had another question about your institutional experiences. So, Unfortunately, many institutions have recently faced extreme disruptions in behavioral norms. Um, a few of the examples that come to mind are the civ mill relations challenges raised by uh, the recent pardon of army officers accused of war crime, um, hints of retaliation against Lieutenant Colonel Vindman from the Na National Security Council for his impeachment testimony, um, and the discovery of a Facebook page where members of Border Patrol shared racist and violent posts. So you guys have a lot of executive and leadership experience. And so I'm, I'm interested in hearing how as leaders, you guys think we can reestablish norms of behaviors in these institutions and um, ensure that the American people have faith in these institutions and also that the people working inside of them feel like they are working at the place that they bought into when they committed to the civil service. Yeah, well, it's a really good question because, but the thing about it is, at the top, we believe it, that the elected leaders should uh, run the country. And um, so you can't help have a government held hostage by civil servants. I mean, there, there's, there's, there, civil servants are wonderful. Everybody needs them. They grow, they're professional. But at the top, you have to have responsiveness to the elected authorities. And so there's always a balance in this. And um, every uh, time I've worked in Washington, we've always um, been very careful about trying to insulate the civil service level from the political level. If it, the political level reaches too far down, you discredit people. You've got to protect ordinary people like Alex Vindman, the Army Lieutenant Colonel who testified in the impeachment. He's just over there on an assignment. If the Army doesn't have that many people who are native Russian speakers, we were, we were really glad we had somebody that smart. And there he is in the White House, and he got himself, you know, in political hot water. 
those things um, happen, but they should happen rarely. So it, you have to, as a civil servant, you have to respect when you're in the institution, you have to respect that the people above you are representing the elected leadership. But when you're part of that political level, you have to respect the traditions, the expertise, and the impartiality of the people who are working for you. So that's a mutual respect, mutual understanding that has to be worked. It's a dynamic balance. It's really up to Congress to maintain that. We put in a professional civil service to get rid of the spoil system in this country 150 years ago, and it's done extremely well for us, and we need to preserve it. I think the, uh, the reassignment of Lieutenant Colonel was both unforgivable and unconscionable. He got reassigned because in the furtherance of his duty at the request of the United States of America, he had experiences and conversations and information relevant to what was transpiring at the time. Wearing in this country's uniform, duty, honor, country, he did exactly what General Clark would have expected him to do because it was his job. And uh, we talk a lot about uh, firewalls, but there needs to be, certainly there needs to be a firewall to protect those who are prepared to speak truth to power. That's one of the reasons I love John McCain. My buddy John and I always didn't always agree, uh, but uh, if you didn't want an answer to a question that you thought you might disagree with, you shouldn't ask exactly. the question. Exactly. I mean, exactly. that's just the way it is. And so exactly. and what I'm really disappointed is, is that not enough people came to his defense. And so you raised a good question. The, the other thing I think it's really important is that whether it's in government or elsewhere, now again, the general's experience is much, much broader than mine. But even in my little time in the military, but as governor, you run large organizations, there are standards of conduct, norms of behavior relative to how you act and how you communicate. And everyone needs to understand them. And those, there's a gray area in there, that's for sure. But certain, certain types of conduct and certain kinds of uh, communications, the racist comments, they're just flat, unacceptable. And I guess you really understand that best if you've been in the military, because when you're putting a wounded soldier on a helicopter, you don't know what his nationality is. Well, you may know that. You may believe very white and blue. And uh, I think there's a the question about norms of behavior is appropriate, not just for government. It's for all institutions, large and small, commercial. And I like the fact that you're even thinking of that as a student. Because when you go around talking about civility, it's one of the most important ways we can inculcate that value. Leaders set a value system and hold a people accountable to it. And when you become a leader, I'm confident you will. Okay, but Liz, can I just have one, you know, two finger up on this one because this is such important so important what governor ridge is saying look truth is that um, the american political system has always been a dynamic balance it's politics is the art of the possible there's no supreme authority to put hard and fast lines down it's up to the electorate that's why we're talking <laughs> i assume everybody on this call is interested enough you're going to vote but what the current incumbent of the White House was able to do is he projected, he's developed a different model of leadership. He's actually showed that he can work leadership in such a way that he doesn't have to appeal to the whole country. He just appeals to his base and he counts on the rest of the country to say, yeah, we don't like it, but, uh, but on balance, uh, well, he's gotten us this and gotten us that. Look, that will become the new standard if it's accepted in the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this is just the way democracy works. This is also the way institutions fail because um, as the forces and, and, and the pragmatism and so forth works in there, 
there's no divine spirit to hold the line. It's just the collective judgment of people who are energized to try to make a difference. So um, I agree with what Tom says about civility and the importance of it, but I just, I mean, that's why we're here. This is a warning. If we want to protect this country, we have to get along with each other. We have to respect each other. But if the political system lets people win and impose their values and their standards without that respect, we're headed in a direction that's going to bring more trouble in the future to all of us. Um, I wanted to circle back to a point that you both made about um, the importance of expertise and also the importance of college students being engaged in the future of our country. So this is the last question from me. I really hope that um, all of the students in the audience are sending all of their questions into the chat so that we'll be ready for the audience Q&A. But um, the last note that I wanted to hit was that as college students, we spend four years or less or more learning how to marshal data and evidence to support our views. And GRI in particular has a focus on evidence-driven policy. But this means nothing if people are unwilling to take our data-driven policy recommendations. So what role should the university play and what role can it play in public discourse and policy formation, given the declining respect that many politicians and citizens seem to have for experts in science? Well, let me uh, take it a uh a crack at that very important question. I think the best approach for any university, large or small, public or private, is to tolerate and encourage, tolerate and even encourage different points of view. It is only through a dialectic that people can sharpen their own ideas, perhaps be enlightened by the thought provoking notion that somebody else offers. I'm afraid sometimes this, and I, whether it's from the right or the left, I mean, certain speech is intolerable, I got that. But I do worry on, about those campuses that set up safe rooms or safe houses where I don't wanna hear somebody who disagrees with me because it might have some kind of impact on me emotionally or intellectually. The strength of democracy has been, in my judgment, and will always be if we allow the dissemination of ideas in a civil way, in a tolerant way, because it is that mutual expression, the candid expression, the tolerance of other people's opinion, not personalizing it, not demonizing it, but my recommendation to colleges and universities, not just tolerate, encourage and protect diversities of you. That is what the dialectic about. And frankly, my best conversations as an undergraduate at Harvard University, uh, by the way, as we're getting into Vietnam, you know, those were pretty interesting conversations. And a lot of people <laughs> disagree. But you know what? The college dining hall, the room, the discussions, they were very important to me intellectually and personally, even though a lot of my classmates didn't agree with me. But I never demonized them. One of my roommates was a conscientious objector. God bless him. He was true to himself, and I respect that. So we ought to respect everybody else when they're true to themselves. Um, so we are getting lots of questions coming in. This all looks very, very good. <laughs> um, please keep them coming, audience. Um, I think while, we, while I kind of continue to read and process this, um, why don't we start off with a question from Meg Hogan about um, the impact of disinformation campaigns on polarization. So I think we're gonna try to unmute her. She can read her, her message. I don't know, Zoom is, Zoom is difficult. Okay, I think I got it. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, you're We good. can hear you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so my question is, in light of the 2016 presidential election and Russia's internet research agencies um, aggressive influence campaign on social media. How do you propose that the American government and media, either together or separately, can combat polarization and truth decay? Just like more generally, because you do see today, at least I do on social media, um, certainly growing polarization. You're either a part of the right or the left. There's the middle's kind of disappeared. Well, you um, have to call out, you have to call out the trolls. And uh, they're on the net today. 
and uh, you can go back and find them. I have a friend in Boston who goes back. You just check the uh, where they're, uh, who they are. You look at the pattern of communication. You look at where their internet is, and um, you can find them. And they're out there hammering every day. They have to be called out. They have to be taken down off Twitter, off off Facebook, off TikTok, off Instagram. And um, the government should uh, not be hesitant to call these trolls out. Uh, I know that um, the, the thing about it is there's a partisan element in this because um, that trolling helped one particular party more than others in the last election. But there's no assurance in the future that that's going to be the case. And uh, given where the, the president is on China, uh, it, it's very possible <laughs> there'll be Chinese trolls uh, going after the Republicans in this election. So I think both parties have an obligation and a duty to protect the sanctity of the American electoral system, including the online discussions and, and chats and so forth that take place. And not only does the government have the responsibility there, uh, I'm going to tell you that I've seen some very interesting initiatives undertaken by the private sector. A group of journalists and lawyers have started a company called NewsGuard, and they've got uh, a cadre of well highly educated uh, global thinkers who take a look at uh, some of many of the transmissions, particularly in the social media, and they score them. Uh, and I think that's very important. We're gonna have an independent third party saying truth back, believe not to believe or be skeptical. But I must tell you, more importantly than anything else, I don't believe that as individual citizens, you are relieved from the responsibility of your own vetting process. What is the source of that accusation? What is the motivation? Is it credible? I mean, I, I don't think, you know, that's one of the challenges with the internet. I mean, there's so many wonderful things associated with the ability to communicate, but it's also a vehicle for, for bigots, malcontents, and cowards to yep. disrupt who we are. So I want the government to be involved. We're going to see more and more news organizations and frankly, in coordination with the government, that's going to be careful. I mean, I'm, I'm not in the set. We, we, we've got to be working on this together, but there's an individual responsibility and vet it. Think about it. What's the source? Is it a third hand remote? If I put it out and tweet it to my 2000, by the way, I don't have a Facebook account. I don't have enough time with the friends I really have let alone getting, hey, I got a million, I don't have a million friends. But we gotta vet it, you have a responsibility to sit and think about your source. Um, before Governor Ridge, I know you have to hop off soon, but before you do, um, we have some questions about the thoughts that you recently published on the environment for Earth Day. So what are some of the areas that you think the Republican Party could agree to or be excited about in terms of environmental stewardship? Well, as I wrote that op-ed, I believe the first thing the Republican Party has to do is acknowledge one, our rich tradition, historic tradition in embracing our responsibility as citizens and as a party to protect the environment. We could start with that. Check, check box number two, science. Science is at the heart of uh, many of these recommendations made by a few Republicans, a lot of Democrats. Since when are we so dismissive of science as we go about uh, formulating public policy. And third, I'm gonna reiterate something that I've been, I said in my op-ed and I will say it to all of you. Uh, I've got uh, a couple kids and to date only one grandchild, but uh, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors. I'm borrowing it from my children and my grandson. And I, my responsibility is to give it back to them better than they gave it to me. And I don't care whether Republican or Democrat, it is one of the areas where I think if we have a Republican party that survives what's going on now, but if we are to get back to our, our, to our traditional embrace of certain principles, one of which was the environment, we better embrace that notion. It was Richard Nixon, Clean Air and Clean Water Act. Richard Nixon. And by the way, I live on the Great Lakes, and uh, the Cuyahoga River outside of Cleveland was on fire because way back when, they thought that you could avoid pollution by dilution. No problem, big bodies of water, let's throw all that junk in. Well, 
It turned out not to be a very good idea, certainly hazardous to health, and more importantly, long-term problems with the environment. We cleaned it up. So I say to my friends in the Republican Party, it's your tradition, embrace it. Science should drive your public policy, and you don't inherit the earth from your ancestors. You borrow it from your children. Thank you. Those are those are great points. Um, I don't know. Uh, I know that maybe you have to go, but I know we also have some more time. Um, one more question. I'm seeing a lot of interest from people on what you guys consider the biggest threat to. American global leadership or to the United States in general. Um, and it seems that people are kind of interested in geopolitical threats, perhaps like the impact of One Belt, One Road and Ascendant China, but also um, more generally like how COVID and um, backsliding democracies are undermining American power or threatening American interests. So what are you guys most concerned about? So all of the above. <laughs> all yeah, thank of you. the above. Thank I mean, you. You know, it starts with us, okay? You can't be, you can't have global leadership if you don't want to lead. So if you don't take responsibility, if you don't put forth a vision, if you don't step up to address the challenges we face, you're not going to be a leader. We've come out of the Paris Climate Accords. We didn't want to lead. Uh, we declare America first. We don't want to lead. We question NATO. We don't want to lead. I was in New York for the UN uh, week last year, and I met with a group of former East European presidents and prime ministers. And uh, I was shocked at how clearly they saw the problem. They said, there's no American leadership. And it goes back to Putin. So they're worried about Putin in Eastern Europe. Um, in the United States, we're worried about China because we see Russia as a distant, different kind of a threat. Uh, but the truth is that we still are the most powerful, influential country in the world. All we have to do is step up and lead. The world wants us out there, not to tell them what to do, but to be there to assist, to set a standard, to uphold higher principles. They look to us as some system to aspire to. So many of the questions you asked earlier about the political and the civil servants, they, they, look, at, they look at our civil servants bureaucracy and they say, they're so wonderful. They look at the armed forces and they say, we'd love to have armed forces that are that just that good and that apolitical. Um, we just have to be willing to accept the mantle of leadership. You can't divorce our standard of living and our well-being that we have in America today from American leadership. And if you try and think you can back away and be more prosperous and better, you're going to be you're going to be disappointed very quickly it's going to come rolling back in on us in a very painful way. Two final points. We can't lead the world when by design withdrawing from it, and we have. The world looks to America for leadership, and that is do as you say, but work with us so we can do it together, particularly those countries who share a basic set of common values. And thirdly, there's no conceivable way for the globalization of everything associated with our daily lives, daily lives, that we can become a better, stronger America by pulling inward. You just can't get there. Remind ourselves of that. And uh, I I'm gonna have to leave, and I apologize. I wanted to like to say a little longer with my friend, but we'll connect it another time. I, my pitch to all of you, my plea, my plea is that uh, the general and I, the, the sun's not setting, but uh, you know, it's well past midway point and it's heading down. If you're a golfer, we're probably on 16 or 17, but we're going to finish the last couple holes of golf pretty strong. Uh, but politics and government's about tomorrow. And students have far more tomorrows than Wes and Tom do. And so I would encourage you to accept the responsibility to shape that tomorrow yourself. As a voter, as an engaged participant at the local level, state level, political level, as an engaged member of your community. You have more tomorrows than Wes and Tom have. So please be engaged. 
please respect differences of opinion, but be involved and ultimately, ultimately, if you do nothing else, don't you dare miss an election. It's your tomorrow. Make something with it. And if you, and if you cooperate, you make a difference, a positive difference. Thank you, General Sergeant Sluting. I'll get back <laughs> at you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Yeah, Thanks, Tom. Time. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank yes, sir. Thanks. So uh, that was an absolute pleasure to have Governor Ridge. Thanks so much for joining us. And we're going to continue with a few more questions for General Clark. Um, we're going to try unmuting again for Sarah Baumfim. She had a great question about civil relations that I think is really interesting. So the experiment with Zoom continues. Sarah, are you online? Unmuted? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're all good. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, General Clark, if you could speak a little bit more on how you see the partisan divide impacting civil military re relations and how this is reflected in our um, foreign policy. And how do you see that we could improve um, the, the political military divide? Well, you're always gonna have a certain divide on this. Um, and um, let me just sketch out history for just a second. Coming out of the Vietnam War, it was the Democrats who forced Nixon to make the peace agreement, unveil the bombing and so forth. And uh, it was Gerald Ford in the White House who was afraid to ask Congress for ammunition for the Vietnamese when they were being overrun by the North. And so for people in the military, we looked as Democrats as sort of the opposition. We looked to the Republican Party as our friends. And maybe it wasn't right, but that's the way it was carried forward. In the 80s, there was a war in Central America. We knew that it was the Russians and the Cubans behind all this with, this, with the fight against the Sandinistas and Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. The Democratic Party stood four square against the military and what was being done down there. And uh, Reagan was uh, almost impeached because of it with the, with the uh, Iran-Contra deal. Um, that uh, back in the 1980s. And so um, the military has always been oriented toward trying to protect the country. The Democrats have always been more oriented on the bread and butter issues in elections. By the time I was a general in the 1990s, it was very obvious. Um, and as a three-star and four-star, when I went to the Hill, the Republicans were actively courting the military. And the Democrats were they were like agnostic. It's like, oh yeah, there's a military there. Yeah, well, uh, but we don't like the fact that uh, they, we'd like to have more money for welfare and uh, what's this military expenditure about? And so there's a natural um, divide there between what the military needs and what the country needs. But one party stepped in to try to make the military its own. And the military doesn't belong to either party. If you talk to the senior people in the military today, if they were candid with you, they'd have a lot of objections to the current direction of what's going on. Uh, but they're loyal and, and, and they follow orders. People in the bottom of the military, they're probably still oriented toward, hey, the Republicans are the good guys. The Democrats are not so much our friends, even though historically, if you look at it, the people that press for the wage increases, better housing, better medical care, uh, and better policies for the troops, that's the Democrats. So. It's a, it's a complex, confusing malign. The most important thing about it is keep the military out of domestic politics. Don't poll the military. Don't ask what the military stands for. Don't try to get the active military involved in the elections. Don't get mad at the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff when he's standing there next to President Trump. That's his job. He can't help it. Don't get mad at the military when they're sending troops down to the border. That's not their choice. And if it were a Democratic president, they'd obey his orders exactly the same way. When you're retired, you're in a different category as far as I'm concerned. I ran for office as a Democrat. But the most important principle is we have a nonpartisan, nonpolitical military. Um, so it's 125. And I think that there are still a few questions lingering on everybody's minds about the coronavirus. So. Something that I'm seeing in the chat is that people are interested in what you think the uh, federal government and also like local government's strengths and weaknesses are when it comes to addressing this and um, how government can remain both connected to like the needs of people 
um, at the local level while also coordinating strategy all the way up the sort of chain uh, or the chain structure of government. And um, I'm interested in the way that COVID has impacted our approach to juggling international security priorities. Um, I was reading through uh, some of the stuff that you've published and I saw your comments on Iran from earlier this year when things were starting to heat up there. And it just reminded me of how difficult it is to maintain our priorities um, while we've got this crisis going on. So what does the Iran case exemplify about the difficulty of maintaining multiple competing policy priorities in a crisis? And um, I think Iran also raises an interesting question, given the scale of the humanitarian crisis there because of COVID. What are the US's obligations to other countries in times of global crisis? If not Iran specifically, then there are certainly many countries that are being very badly hit right now. And do we have an obligation to them? So COVID as it relates to domestic policy and foreign policy. And then if you have any concluding remarks you'd like to give, that would be fantastic. Sure. Well. So um, all foreign policy comes from domestic politics. It has no other basis and it has no other legitimacy. So if the people in a country don't support and don't want to be involved abroad, don't want to help involve and so forth, um, you don't really have a legitimate basis for providing that help. And um, for a long time, the policy elites in the United States have kept the United States engaged globally because they saw the importance of it. Whereas there's been a steady drumbeat in favor of patriotism, but not in favor of things like foreign aid and other things that come from the right wing media. And this is, this is con constant. This is not new. This goes back into the, into the, actually back to the end of World War I. So, um, so there's a, there's a partisan divide there in what, uh, the obligations and responsibilities are. Um, and COVID only makes it more difficult to follow through because attention is distracted. Now, in terms of the domestic side and what that means for us domestically, well, I mean, this is gonna be a judgment. The election is gonna be a judgment on President Trump's leadership. Uh, in my view, the leadership was deficient early on because he downplayed the crisis. I understand why he did it because he didn't wanna excite problems with the economy. He views he's going to get reelected if the Dow Jones industrial average is 30,000. That's what he's shooting for. That's the way he measures himself. He's a very strategic and goal-oriented leader. And you may not like him. You may think he's unprincipled. You may think he's unethical. But one thing, and you may think he's not that smart. I'm not going to address any of this, but I will tell you this. As somebody who's watching it from a distance, he's very strategic. So. You know, for him, what he's trying to do is navigate through this thing so that by September, when people are looking at the economy, we're back to work again. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is moving up. And people say, yeah, there were these, uh, there were these criticisms. And uh, yeah, you know, those nerdy people on the East Coast, those elites, they don't like our president. But, but you know, he's done a good job. And look, everything's OK now. That's, that politics is going to drive the response to COVID. And somehow in the middle of that, our elected representatives are trying to make sure small businesses survive, that people get the assistance, that states and local government get the added need so that a recession caused by um, a white collar vacation here that's thrown you all out of your university, but it doesn't become a five year, 10 year depression as the American economy comes apart. So somehow, the people in Washington, the leaders, they've got to work through the politics. Nancy Pelosi has to balance it off every day. Is if she does relief and the president says, hey, I got that bill passed. Really, Nancy did that and Democrats did that. But this is the nuance of the American political system. So um, I think I want to express my sympathy for you all because you were deprived of the last half of your senior year. And I know how valuable that was. And I want to express my sympathy also for trying to go out into the job market or the uncertainties about next year in graduate school. I know that's going to be difficult for you. Uh, but um, we're going to get through this. All of us are going to get through this. And it may be unpleasant and you may be delayed a little bit, but uh, you'll find a way. We're very resilient because we're a democracy. We're very resilient as a country. But we can only be resilient and strong if you're engaged in voting. So please, 
pay attention to these issues and the personalities and, and what it means. I don't think we can do enough to protect the freedom and, and safeguard our precious liberty through the electoral process. It is under attack. And somehow we as citizens have to be vigilant against that. We can't let our enemies use the very freedoms we treasure to destroy our own society. But we can't rely just on government to protect us. We have to protect ourselves. Thank you very much, Liz, Rebecca, all of you who've been on. If you will send me those questions, I'll try to get them answered through Renew America together so we can keep this dialogue going. I'd love to know what you're asking. I see occasional questions popping up on the screen and um, I really treasure this dialogue and I'll get them to Tom Ridge and, and he'll participate. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for, for being part of this. Um, thanks to all of our attendees for tuning in and for giving such great questions. And I hope that we have the opportunity to maybe have an in-person event. I would definitely come back to campus for that. I would come back post-graduation for that.